Good evening, everybody, and welcome to LairMedia.tv and to this edition of Lair Confidential. And uh, our text line is 89 Councillor, I like saying that now, Councillor Ken Swollen. Are you used to it yet, Ken? Welcome to the programme. Thanks very much, Pat. Um, no, I'm not used to being called councillor. Um, and it's, it's something I prefer not to be called. I, I prefer people to call me Ken because I, I'm not into these titles at all. Like, you know, even when, look, I spent 30 years as a guard and, and, and um, I didn't like people calling me guard either. I like to be called Ken, you know, yeah, because, is, you know, yeah. you deal with people and you're dealing with people on their level. Yes. And um, I would expect people to, 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 to deal with me yeah. on, on the same level, you know, um, because people would be more comfortable dealing with somebody that they can call by their, their, their first name. You know, I, I, I hate this thing of Mr. And people would be calling. I always tell when somebody calls me Mr. or counsel, I say, look, my name is Ken and call me Ken, you know. Now, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, you were elected, obviously, in the Tullamore. You're a Tullamore man, as we were saying before we came on here, Tullamore man. I am. Tara. Now, I, I spoke to you just three months ago, as we were saying before we came on. It's time absolutely flies. I, I couldn't believe it's three months until I looked at the date we were speaking to you last year on the show. And we're delighted to have you again, Ken. Well, how do you, you. find, um, on the council itself, how do you find um, trying to get a motion? How do you go about getting support for a motion, if you wanted to put a motion? You know, obviously, to bring up something at the council. How do you find it? Well, well so far, I, I brought a few motions to the council, and so far, I've had no problems with that because they have been popular enough uh, motions. The last one I brought was last week um, in relation to the, the, the soldiers in Jadotville um, that were involved in the, the siege of Jadotville uh, in the Congo in 1961. And um, all of those, so there was 32 of those soldiers recommended by their commanding officer, Commandant Pat Quinlan, uh, for medals, and uh, they never received the medals. And um, it was just a motion that I had with Offaly County Council um, calling on the government to actually give those people their medals because of those 32, there are only eight alive. So I think it's, it's, it's well past time that they, oh, those, like they were brave men. And I, I had never seen the, the film until a few weeks ago. And I saw the film. There's this film called The Siege of, of, of Jadotville. Jadotville, yeah. And, um, you know, they, they, they were extremely brave men, what they did, and um, they were up against forces. They, 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 it was 20 to 1 at least, and there was over 3,000, and there was only 155 Irishmen together. And, the, you know, Swedish UN troops and Irish UN troops tried to reach them. They couldn't reach them. So, And um, the fact that they surrendered is the reason that it, it was looked... Well, it, look, it was, it, it was probably the main reason, and... Uh, it, that they didn't get their medals, it was looked, it was frowned upon, and uh, they were made to feel um, similarly to what, uh, or similar to what the uh, soldiers that fought in World War One were made to feel. They were made to feel ashamed, yeah. and they couldn't talk about it. it. And there's shocking. Only, shocking. yeah, and there, there's only eight of those men still alive, and you know there, there was a warplane attacking them as well. There was mercenaries, and you know it, it it was an unbelievable challenge that they faced, and none of them were killed. You know, whereas there there was you know. Um, it's probably not a thing to brag about or to, to boast about, but they inflicted a lot of casualties on the enemy. They did. Um, there, there was 300 of, of the enemy killed and there was up to 1,000 of them injured, whereas not one Irish soldier was killed. A few were injured, all right, but um, they carried out unbelievably brave deeds out there and um, they were never recognised for it. You know, and that, That's why I was asked by... Um, uh, a few soldiers would would I bring a motion like that to Offaly County Council, and I did, and it did receive overwhelming support. Um, a similar motion was brought before Westmeath County Council um, well, mm. last week as well, and one in Waterford, and and they have all been supported. So look, oh. I can only hope that um, these these men are granted their medal because there's only eight of them alive. So, you know, yes. Now the thing about Jadaville, of course, uh, for people. Uh, that weren't around at the time, as you said, they surrendered to save their lives, not because they were cowards, Ranty, as you said rightly. Well, absolutely, they, they, had, funny, they had run I out of ammunition. With, with that, Ken. Yeah, they I, had I run out of ammunition. Army. Yeah, I yeah. joined the army in 1969, and uh, my drill sergeant had been in the Congo. Hmm. Now, he hadn't, he hadn't been at Jadaville, but he had been around the same time as the Naimba ambush, you know? 
mm. uh, that time in the Congo. But to yeah. heroics for the Irish troops, and they have handled themselves with extreme admiration throughout yeah. there, the way they behaved, and also the continuation of that out in the Middle East around the yeah. Lebanon. They yeah. had the highest regard, because I was over in Israel myself, and um, the very minute I mentioned Irish to the lads, I was having coffee with the natives, uh, Israelis, yeah. all absolutely the blue helmets. They associated yeah. the blue helmets with Ireland, yeah. you know, which is incredible. Ah, but, yeah, you know, of, 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 this of is course a, it is, yeah. This is a desperate injustice that's being done. It's a terrible injustice. You, you have know, to those, call those, it for what it is, you know. Exactly. Well, those, those men not only had to run out of ammunition, but they had run out of drinking water as well. And they received drinking water in, in empty petrol cans. But they couldn't drink it because it was petrol that was in those cans. So, you know, the, the commanding officer, the, the, the men themselves were prepared to fight on. But fight on with what? I think they were prepared to go hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat because they had no weapons left. You know, they were extremely brave men and they were very professional in what they were doing. They and were. There was Absolutely. no other alternative um, but, but, but to surrender. Those men would have been wiped out if they hadn't surrendered. So that motion on it, in Offaly County Council, did that, yeah. that, I assumed that that got all party support. It did. It got overwhelming support. No, it got overwhelming support from, from those that were left in the council chamber at the time. And that's an issue that I have with these council meetings that, um, you know, not every councillor stays until the very end. They stay until the issue or problem or subject that they're interested in is dealt with. And then they get up and leave. Whereas I... I you know, that, that shows disrespect not only to the people at the meeting, but it shows disrespect to the, the people that actually, the people of Offaly. Um, you know, there, there, was only, there was only 11 councillors left out of 19 um, in the room yeah. at that stage. But it did get overwhelming support, you know. That's and good. So, and and we've, I find that the other motions, you know, I brought a motion to the council in relation to antisocial behaviour um, in Offaly. Now, I presume that Look, we all know that antisocial behaviour is widespread throughout the country and there's a major drugs problem as well, which is really not spoken enough about. Um, no. As far as I'm concerned, the government tried to, to hush this and to, to speak as little as possible about it. But it's a major problem. It's a, it's a pandemic as far as I'm concerned. Um, there are so many uh, young and old people um, involved in drugs, taking drugs now. And, um, you know, the, the, it, it's causing deaths. Um, right throughout the country and it's a huge trade it's a huge profitable trade for so many people and it's in every housing estate um, in, in the country and in, in Offaly it's a problem in a few housing estates and it's time that as far as I'm concerned that the council dealt with this it's also time that the Gardaí dealt with it because, um, you know, a, a, a young man, 18-year-old man, was severely injured only a few weeks ago in the Tullamore area. And um, he was so severely injured that he will never walk again. And that's all as a result of the drugs trade, even though he wasn't dealing in drugs himself. Um, and but, the, how, how, uh, sorry, Kwari Kasha, Ken, hmm. how, is, how are the Gardaí units... Um, distributed in Offaly in the sense that have they a dedicated drugs unit around that area yes. or how yeah. does it work? Yeah, they would have a dedicated drugs unit, but there wouldn't be half enough. There wouldn't be quarter enough uh, people yeah. attached to the drugs unit. And uh, Garda resources have, have been cut to the bone. No matter what, um, you know, the, the Minister for Justice or no matter what Garda management might say, because Garda management will never really admit that Garda resources are, are cut to the floor because... Oh. Look, once you get to the stage of superintendent, well, look, they're looking at promotion. If they admit the, 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 that the problem is as bad as it is, well, it ruins their promotion prospects. So they don't admit to these things. But I know from talking to guards on the ground that, you know, morale is not good um, and guard resources are very bad. Um, and, and, you know, you, you do need more um, units like the armed response unit to deal with problems like this. Like it's only last week that a house in Tullamore was shot up. Now, if that happened um, six months ago, it would make the headlines. But it happened, and very few people know about it. But there was actually shots fired at a house. And then, you know, just, just around the corner from that, another house was targeted as well. All the windows were broken, front windows were broken, and a car outside it, um, the, the, the windows were smashed in that as well. But 
you know, this is becoming the norm and, and we have to put a stop to it before it actually gets worse. Because I have no doubt that if we don't put a stop to this, people are going to die. And in Tullamore, it's been a few years since I was there and I just passed through it, but in Tullamore itself, is there um, CCTV there? There is CCTV in there. In the town? There is, but but it's, you know, there's not enough CCTV at all there. Just the same as there isn't in, in, yeah. in most towns. Um, some of the estates don't have it, and um, anything that is there it really is inadequate. It's not fit for purpose at all. Yeah. You know, we are getting to the stage where you do, you probably do need CCTV, uh, uh, you know, at almost every corner, because things are so dangerous now. And there's the, like, when I say that there are people um, living in fear and people are prisoners in their own homes, I know people who will not come outside the front door. Their children are being targeted. Children are being targeted um, to, to, to sell drugs for these people or to carry drugs uh, and to deliver them. And if the, the, the children as young as 10 years old don't do that, well, then the house is targeted. Windows are either broken or there's graffiti put on the walls or, or on, know, of the house true. or the front wall. You know, it, it's... It's terrible intimidation and people are suffering this in silence. And I have been banging on this door for the last uh, four or five, six months or so. And I will continue to do it uh, at the next council meeting as well. And, 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 mm. You brought that up at the yeah. council meeting about yeah. antisocial behaviour. What yeah. kind of debate ensued? Was there an acknowledgement that there is a problem? Because sometimes that, that's a difficult thing to get people to admit to. You see, Pat... Um, the political people and council people, officials in the council would talk about things like stakeholders. Now, stakeholders to me is only a word that means nothing, really. Yes. You know, they'll talk about bringing, stake, bringing all the stakeholders in to Together. discuss these problems. And you're talking about TUSLA that many people don't trust, that organization. But you're talking about organizing um, events in different housing estates um, like there was recently last week or two weeks ago. And I had nothing to do with it because I didn't agree with it. I, I just knew it was a, it, it was just a cover up um, to show that the, the council were doing something about it. They had, they brought in two tents and they were doing face painting and stuff like that. And then they were talking about sporting activities. They actually talked about library services and giving some of these people um, free library cards and, and access to the libraries. Like, if you have heart and drug dealers, they don't give a damn about libraries. <laughs> their, their, their children don't give a damn about it's libraries. It's free anyway to join the library. It is, yeah, it's, it's free. But, <laughs> they, you know, they, they, they'll be talking about different things as it picking them up and bringing them to the library. Like, it's crazy stuff. That is Honestly. not what needs to be done because these people, a lot of these people are vicious and you're not going to, you know, give them a book and they'll read it. Like, that just is crazy. It just goes to show, as far as I'm concerned, how far out of touch some of these um, council officials and other county councillors are because they will fall for this and they'll go along with this and the problem will just continue to worsen. It does need severe action. It needs action by the Gardaí, but it also needs um, action by the county councils who are prepared to take legal pr proceedings for eviction from houses if, if the full family is involved in, in, in the um, antisocial behaviour, exactly. or for exclusion orders against particular offenders. You know, because look, we all know too that there are innocent mothers and fathers and innocent families living in houses where there might be one thug living in there and maybe one drug dealer. It's, it's time to get him out of there, him yeah. or her, yeah. whichever it is, get them out of there because they, they cause absolute mayhem, not only for their neighbours, but for the whole estate. They cause terrible anxiety for, for elderly people as well in particular. Um, it, it's just shocking what's being done. And you, a bugbear of mine, Ken, I don't know about you, but bear in mind is this. When I hear discussions about antisocial behavior and drug pushing, the next sentence invariably is always, he came from a deprived area. Now, to me, that is saying we can do nothing about it. Yeah. The reason the area is deprived is because invariably the politicians are making that point is it is as a result of their social policies, policies, their failed 
source of viruses. Would you think that? I, 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 I totally agree. Um, you know, I, I visit a number of families every single day and invariably I, I would be in some housing estates in different towns throughout the Midlands region, not only Offaly, yeah. uh, but uh, in Westmeath, in Roscommon, in Longford, in, in Leash. But I, I would visit the, and I know by looking at young children that in these estates, I just know that these young children will end up on social welfare themselves. They will end up in social housing if they're lucky. Their parents will say what a lot of parents say to, 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 to or what a lot of their parents said to them is, once you're 18, I'm bringing you to the county council. We're going to put you on the housing list. Now, that's not saying a whole lot for a parent who will say, you know, the ambition that they have for their children is to get on the council list and get into social housing and then go on the dole because that's what we did. That's what our parents did. That's what your brothers and sisters did. Education is the key as far as I'm concerned. We need to um, provide better education facilities. Um, you know, Don O'Malley brought in free second level education um, we need to be looking at, and I know it's 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 um, very aspirational, but I, we we need to to look at a situation, or how we can drive towards a situation where third level education is free, and where where every child has the same access to third level education. Absolutely, and another thing I miss out of the education system, I'm showing my age here. I think they were it. A terrible loss was the old vocational schools. Yeah, I agree Where fully. In, in secondary school now, in their second level education, all the discussion from the time they go in the door till they go out is university, university, and pints and pints and pints. Yeah. Whereas in the vocational school, you have very talented people, men and women, young boys mm. and girls, who are very talented artistically and with their hands. And these were catered for in the vocational school sector for the one yeah. time award. I, I agree so, fully, you know, where, where are our future carpenters? Where are our future builders? Where are our future plumbers, our, our electricians? You know, and, and these people, yeah, where are they? And where, you know, we know that the government uses the excuse that, um, you know, it, it's impossible for uh, county councils to build houses now because all of our builders emigrated all of the people with experience emigrated yeah. back after 2008 2010 you know surely we can actually train more youngsters into how to do these the, 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 to have these skills I know. you know it, it doesn't make sense but uh, no you're right about vocational schools you know they were hands-on and um were. So, some some fantastic people came from oh, vocational yeah. schools you know I remember uh, uh, it, loads of people in my in my year, my class. They they went to the vocational schools, and they're fantastic. They're, they're and most of them that I know of that are still knocking around in the local are self-employed. They have their own yeah. businesses. Yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. Yeah. Uh, my special guest is Ken Smullen here on Lear Confidential on Lear Media TV, and delighted to have him, Councillor Ken Smullen, Offaly County Council. Now, Ken, another area. I was just reading a statistic. I couldn't. I read it a few times. The Ken Swollen food appeal, we just spoke about briefly the last time. But uh, Ken, uh, I must say to you, I must applaud you. And um, absolutely the awareness. And something like uh, food distributed to 400 families. It's actually 839 families Yeah, now. but at the, even at 400, when I was reading the statistic. Yeah. 400 families in a small geographical area is well, shocking. It is, it's absolutely. But you see, that, that's, we're not even scratching the surface yet, Pat. Um, <clears throat> it is estimated that, you see, the figures I used to work on were figures from, from um, research that was carried out in 2013 by two trade unions, Mandate and Unite. They said that there were was, was 600,000 people on this island. Uh, that don't have enough food to eat every day. Now, I was contacted by the grandson of a former Minister for Health, Dr. Noel Brown. The man's name was uh, Glyn Carraher. And he was involved in research in NUIG <clears throat> at the end of 2018. <clears throat> and he told oh, me, Ken, your, fi your figure is wrong. 
He says the figure of people who are experiencing food poverty in Ireland right now is in excess of 750,000 people, half of them being children. Now, that to me is criminal. It is just not right that children are going to school hungry, children are going to, school, going to bed hungry. That, I, I can't see how that can sit right with anybody. And, you know, what, what, I, I actually found this problem because I was attending all of these repossession courts after the bank bailout, so many yes. mortgage holders were some caught. Horrific and, stories. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I found that some people were going without uh, adequate supplies of food just to keep the banks off their backs. And this was a new phenomenon to me. I just couldn't understand it. And, and, and I discovered, to make a very long story short, I discovered that there was one particular family uh, from the Tullamore area going to Dublin, getting on the train, not paying on the train, and if they were put off the train, they'd get back on the train, maybe in Kildare or Newbridge or someplace like that, but they wouldn't pay. And they were just going up there to get something to eat, to queue up outside of the old central bank building on Dame Street oh, yeah. to get something to eat. So myself and a few other people went up there one night uh, in late, in November 16, I think it was. Yes. And um, we couldn't believe what we were seeing. There were people queuing up, young and old, um, there was, and, and they clicked them through. There was 195 went through um, the first night we were there. And coincidentally, or whether it was a coincidence or, a coincidence or not, I spoke to the people, uh, to as many of those people that were queuing up as I could. And I found that I found three people there from Offaly who had made their way up. And so we went back up again the following week. And that was worse. There was something like 240 people queuing up there. And there was young children as well being held in their parents' arms. And there was elderly people on walking sticks. And uh, the people up there were brilliant. You know, it, it, it was a group called You're Not Alone. And it was Mick Maher and his, his wife, uh, Phil, and, and, and their All family. Right. Yeah. And the group of people there. And, and it was brilliant. But there is a different group there every single night. And, and that, that situation is there still. Um, because the situation, as far as I'm concerned, has worsened than it was then. But we were asked then... Uh, have you seen what's happening on O'Connell Street? And we didn't know what they were talking about. So we went down to O'Connell Street and they were clicking them through as well. And there was up to 400 people queuing up close to the uh, GPO yeah. just to get food. And I just thought, Jesus, we know nothing about this. You'll never see this on, on RTE or TV3 News. You'll never hear about no. it on the radio. No. But there's so many people back home that will not be able to make their way to the larger centres, such as uh, Dublin, Cork, Limerick, Cork, or, or, or Galway, or whatever. So we decided to look for those people at home. And the reason it was called the Ken Small and Food Appeal was because the only person that they would have to contact was me. Because if they contact the likes of the St. Vincent de Paul or any other charity, it could be Tom, Mick, Mary, Harry, or whatever they'll be talking the day, and tomorrow they'll be talking to maybe different people. So... Yeah. We guarantee a totally confidential service. The people that actually help me don't know where I go with the food. I'm the only person that has access to that list. But I do have, um, the, there is one other person who has access to that list, who knows where to get access to that list, just in case the good man above decides I'm no longer fit for purpose. It wouldn't be fair of me to take that list with me. But yeah. that's where we are. Only last week we were fighting since um, we applied in August 2018 for charity status and thankfully only about five days ago we were granted full charity status. Now, so now will that mean, what will that mean for you Ken? Will it mean? Nothing really Pat. It, all, it will, business? all it will really mean is that um, they won't, I, I won't have to uh, be worried about getting, not that I was too worried about it anyway, but, but I, I was getting letters from the charities regulator threatening to prosecute me uh, and telling me that on conviction, I could be fined up to 300,000 euros um, and or up to 10 years in prison for feeding people, okay. you know, and for acting as a, like a charity. So, you know, and, and I got one of those letters as recent, well, maybe it could be a year ago now, um, but I was not going to stop. I simply was not going to stop. And I'd say they were hoping that I was going to go away. Um, I was not going to go away. And as you, when you say, talk about ex expanding it, the only w way I would expand it is if when I get more families contacting me or when I get uh, 
organizations that contact me as well would say there's a lot of family resource centers uh, contact me now when they yes. know that there's people out there that need help. Um, there are other organizations that contact me when, when they need, when they know. But uh, you know, Ken, help. It, I think sometimes the easiest thing to do is to be critical of everything and everybody. But what, what I cannot understand is this. Kids going to national school, I'm not saying secondary school, kids going to national school hungry every morning. Yeah. The teachers surely can see that. Some teachers are very good. Passion. Every day. And so, mm. therefore, I know there's only so much anybody can do. Obviously, yeah. I know that. They don't want to be interfering. I know that as well. Yeah. Surely, it's the children's uh, health and well-being is... So well, you see any embarrassment. Well, you see, Pat, um, some teachers are very good in that respect. They can spot these children that they know haven't, probably haven't had a breakfast, and they look after them. Some of these teachers look after them. No, there are probably other teachers that don't take that much interest in it. But one of the major problems is that parents are so embarrassed about this situation. They feel so ashamed that they're asking their children not to let on that they had no breakfast that morning. And of course, the children will do as mommy or daddy has asked, and they won't say it to anybody. And if the teacher says, did you get something to eat? The child will say yes, even though, uh, just because they're trying to protect mommy or daddy, because they feel mommy or daddy's embarrassment as well. You know, it, it's a very tricky situation. And every day I learn something new about this whole thing. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I know that, you know, I, I have learned nothing really about it yet. It's something that I've only known about for the last four years, we'll say. Um, but I find something different about it every single day. I found, find new levels of embarrassment, new levels of shame. Some of the people that I'm calling to won't even let me know, even though I know them for the last couple of years, they won't let me know how bad things are. They'll tell me that things are not that bad, and they'll tell me, oh, look, Ken, bring that food to somebody else. They'll need it worse. But I know that they have had nothing to eat today or yesterday. You know, And around... Uh, Tullamore, there's a couple of secondary schools. There is, yeah. And do they have um, <clears throat> do they have a provision for hot meals in the schools? They do, but you see, children have to go in and bring their two euros in. So you're going to get children that or two euros every day. Yeah, it, it would. Yeah, it's it's not free. That's ten um, euros a week. Yeah. And, and, and no, like, like I can't be guaranteed, I can't be sure of that, but I think it is, is, is two euros. Um, but even if it's a euro, you know, you're going to have a hell of a lot of kids that will go in, oh, I forgot my money today. Um, or, and it's not every child that will use that facility. Um, every primary school out there is not a DESH school. So, you know, we, we have to work towards a situation where all of these schools are DESH schools where, where food is available for these children. Um, because no child is going to learn properly on an empty stomach. No. And um, a lot of these children are going to school as well. And once they get to school, especially in the winter, it's the first place they feel warmth because they have been in a cold house all night. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the places I noticed that um, was at election time four years ago, I remember knocking on doors and there was people opening doors and there was no blast of heat coming out of the house and that was in January. So I, and there were people, a lot of people wearing coats and that's one of the things that I noticed as well and I still notice it um, during the winter time especially is the amount of people wearing coats inside the house. Yeah, that that's means a sure the, sign. Yeah. And you That's don't. One of the signs. Yeah, and if and it's very cold, America, out, of course, it's mm -hmm. some of the schools. There's been articles, plenty of articles around where children who line up for their food, and if they don't have their money, or if they owe money, they won't be given their food. Yeah, I, I think that's. I think they, that's they absolutely put, criminal. And, and put into the bin. I think it's shocking. It's just shocking. Yeah. yeah, I think it's desperate. And do you know something, Pat? And it's terrible. And it, I, I feel. Look, we ha we, in Offaly, we had a vote on the, on, on, the, on the property tax last Monday. Yeah. Now, you know, it was increased by 15%. I read that, 15%. Last, last year. No. You know, the con is 
we're not looking for an increase this year. We just want to maintain it at last year's rate. The fact is that property tax can ever only be increased by 15% from the base rate of 0.18% of the value of your home. In other words, and it goes back to that base rate once the 12 month period is up. Yeah. So in other words, if the council officials, council management wants councils or councillors to vote to retain last year's 15% increase, it means that they want, they want councillors to vote for another 15% increase. Councillors will get away with this with some people by saying, we didn't vote for an increase, we just kept it at last year's rate. But that's the con there. Now, 70% of the families that I call to, because I was looking at it, I was asked about it a few weeks ago, and I reckon it's 70 or maybe slightly over 70% of the families I'm calling to are homeowners in distress, um, trying to keep the roof over their heads, paying these banks every cent that they can, and going hungry. Women in particular are going hungry uh, on purpose one or two days a week. I met one lady who was going without food three days a week, just so that she could feed her children. Mm, yeah. and, and husbands or partners don't realize that women are secretly going hungry just to feed their kids. And we are living this shame. This is 2020 and yeah. this is here. And I'm, I'm only getting to 839 families right now. You know, that is not even scratching the surface. It is and estimated that... that yeah. All those families are in a radius of where you live. Yeah, it's, it's Offaly and its surrounding counties. Now, there are eight counties in total. Yeah, say, but you know, still, yeah. yeah, but it is it's estimated. Often, and as you said, you're possibly just barely scratching the surface, which is a savage, savage indictment. In well, Pat, it, it is estimated that in Offaly and its surrounding counties that there are over 100,000 people experiencing food poverty. You can exactly from the figures that yeah. So, so, so therefore, I'm not even I'm not even scratching the surface, and the problem is I will never get to uh, most of the people because they will never contact me. They'll contact and nobody. They, I haven't looked into the local property tax myself, but mm. is there any derogation given? You see, <laughs> there there isn't. No, not 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 to homeowners. No, because if you have a property, then you owe. The property tax. It's as simple as that. Uh, I, I disagree with a property tax on a family home. If you have um, a house for investment or if you have a, a holiday home, um, well, by all means, that should Absolutely. be. Yeah, there should be a property. But there shouldn't be a property tax on your family home because no. you've already paid for the house or you're, pay, you're, you're still paying a mortgage for it. Now, people in social housing don't pay a property tax because that's the, they're exempt from that. Um, you know, so... so and it causes, it causes a huge divide between you people. You know, off the top of your head, you probably don't. I should have asked you this beforehand before we came on here. How much does Offaly County Council, um, the income from the property tax, is that figure given in the accounts of the council? Um, I couldn't tell you exactly well, what that, is, then, Pat, but I do know what they're spending. Spe yeah, I, do, I, I know that they're spending it locally. Now it's it's being spent on town and village renewal schemes. Now look, wh wh which um, the work that was done in Tullamore last year, yes, the town um, looks very well, but at the same time, businesses are failing uh, left, right, and centre. Um, yeah. Tullamore, yeah. Uh, look, uh, you know, I might be biased in saying it, but I don't think I, I am. I think the evidence and the proof was there that 20 years ago, Tullamore was the best town in the Midlands. It was ahead of Atlone, it was ahead of Mullingar, it was ahead well, of... It was very busy, very busy. Yeah. And Tullamore now is, is lagging behind those three towns. And um, there is no sign of any recovery for Tullamore. And look, there's not going to be a sign of a recovery for, for any town now. After well, town COVID yeah. Yeah. Recently, um, how did that come about recently, without getting too political about it? The lockdown of County Offaly. Now, from afar, from down here in Limerick, now, uh, I don't know all the ins and outs of the reason why, but certainly one of the main reasons for it was the meat factory. 
Yeah, there was a and meat why plant. Why did they down the whole bloody face? Well, it wasn't right what happened there insofar as there were people that tested positive in that meat plant and that meat plant remained open. And I kicked up over that and a lot of people, local people, you know, they, they said that yes. I was responsible for closing that meat plant. But it was only right and to show solidarity with the people of the town that they should close their doors. And they did so for two weeks. You know, um, we're all hurting over this. And meat plants definitely need investigation once this COVID-19 uh, crisis or pandemic or whatever it is, is over. Um, but maybe it should happen sooner than that because people are working very closely with each other. And then they're going out into the community. They're going home. And it's very easy to see how this thing is actually spreading. Yeah. Um, you know, it, not only is it meat plants, it's, it's, it's kids going to school. You know, it's, it's very easy to say, put these youngsters into different bubbles and put them together. And there's only four or five of them together. Yeah. But once they walk outside the gate of the school, well, once they go into the playground, that doesn't matter. Yeah. They're, they're gathering around right. together right. and right. then they're going home and they're going home to their parents and their grandparents. So, and, then, and then we'll ask, how is this thing spreading? You know, they closed the pubs. I know a lot of people would say the pubs should, should have remained closed. As far as I'm concerned, they should have opened the pubs where this thing could have been regulated. And they should have banned house parties. They should have banned major um, amounts of people gathering in, uh, in housing, in, in housing estates or at parties or whatever. You know, let them go to where this thing can be controlled. And that was in the pubs. And if a pub didn't um, do its job properly, close it down. And can the GA matches, particularly because Offaly is still a good GA county, down here, uh, up to recently, there was nobody allowed at GA matches, but yes, you could drive across the border to any Offaly hurling and football matches. Yeah, look, Pat, the, 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 the rules and regulations uh, and, and the recommendations are so confusing. Um, <laughs> and pe people do not know what they are. Like, you ask me what they are. I haven't a bloody clue what they are because they change from day to day and week to week. <laughs> Who asked the guards what they are? Yeah. I can guarantee you that 90% of guards on the beat on, in patrol cars haven't a clue what they're supposed to be doing. You want to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they're so <laughs> confused with the thing. There's a few guards I know they wouldn't go off the record. They said they couldn't close down the meat plants. Yeah. They didn't yeah. have law on their side to actually shut them. Yeah, well, we all know why meat plants are being looked after no, because and, you have the wealthy friends of different yeah. politicians. We didn't go golfing, no? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, think the, I think the last time I, I played golf was in 1978, so that's not <laughs> there yesterday. <laughs> There was a discussion today about the gathering of young people in Galway. Yeah. I saw that. Yeah. And I think they were way, way over the top from nine o'clock this morning all day long in all the stations. I think they were dreadfully unfair. People were saying they should be jailed, they should be locked up. And I sent in a text to uh, one of the stations saying, what about the inquiry into the Clifton golf club? Yeah. Is yeah. that concluded? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I looked at that thing down in Clifton. There's a huge amount of questions um, that probably haven't been asked officially about that yeah. in relation to certain people that were there. We all know that this judge, um, you know, was there and, and, and uh, what's going to happen with him. Well, there's not a looking into the behavior of that judge. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah exactly. Like, you know, it, it just it doesn't make sense. Um, but, but then again, you, you, you had the likes of um, Brian Hayes there and he had his his friends in the vulture funds, they, they were also there. Like, why were they there? And why were they mixed up with them, a lot of politicians? <laughs> um, you know, there are a lot of questions to be answered there, Pat, but uh, these questions won't be asked officially and in the official quarters. But surely our public service broadcaster has a role in investigating these kind of things and highlighting for the general public. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree. Like, we'll say a lot of questions should have been asked by a lot of TDs. Um, that, that, that weren't asked um, because they're mixed up with these people too. 
I don't trust this system, Pat. I never did. Um, and just because I got elected as a county councillor doesn't mean that I'm going to change in any way. I'm not going to change in any way. I don't trust government figures. I don't trust CEO figures. No. Or, I, 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 or sorry, CSO figures. I, I don't trust any figures that the government released. You were talking about Tullamore and, and the, um, the COVID-19 thing. Um, you know, it, it was the, the, the figure for Tullamore between June 8th and August 8th was eight people tested positive for COVID-19. Now, that meat plant in Tullamore happened during that time. There were nine people tested positive for that in the meat plant alone. And they gave the fifth official figure for Tullamore as being eight. Now, I do know that there was rel relatives of at least one of those people contacted COVID-19 as well. I know that from that meat plant, there were 11 positive results, even though the official result uh, uh, the figures was eight. So that's just a small example. And what drives me mad about the way they report the figures is they say there's eight cases in Tullamore, right? Yeah. But that's it. They never say how many of them are sick, how many of them are out of work, how many of them are in hospital, how many of them are in intensive care. They don't give yeah. a breakdown. Yeah, and, and that's the problem. People don't trust these figures, and yeah, you can see that's the, why these skepticism about. Yeah, there, there's yeah. terrible skepticism. No, I, I see that they're trying to correct it now by by allowing people to talk and tell their stories, and and maybe it's a bit late now, yeah. in the day because people think that they're being manipulated now. Um, but in relation to that, I do know that there there is one um, paramedic, and she wrote about her story on on uh, Facebook today. And she's in Tullamore and um, she dealt with a COVID patient and she found herself in uh, the, the, the emergency care unit herself. And um, it was very touch and go with her for the last week or so. And thankfully, she appears to be recovering from it now, but she's still very ill. But she's only a young lady. And she didn't realize that the patient she was picking up had COVID-19. That patient died. All right, and, and, and she contracted COVID-19 from that patient only about three weeks ago. And it, it, it almost took her life as well. And she's a young mother herself. And um, would she be in her, would she be under, under 40? Oh, she is, yeah. She's, oh, she's, yeah. 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 She's on, she, she's, she wrote her story on, on Facebook there. Um, it, it's there for the public to see. It's Paula, Paula King Delaney is the, the, the lady's name. She wrote her full story there. And today it's it's on Facebook. And before you know, I, we before we conclude, Ken, mm -hmm. um, I'm just thinking: Are there people? I'm even afraid to ask because I've seen a few, one or two around Shannon where I live myself, on the road out. Are there people living in tents and sleeping in their cars around? Yeah. No, <clears throat> I do know that there are. As regards cars, I haven't come across anybody in a car for the last year or so. Good. But that's not to say they're there. Yeah. They're, they're not there. Because the people I found sleeping in cars um, two, three years ago, they did not want me to know that they were there. And they didn't want me searching for them. They, did not, they, they were disappointed when I found them there. And I had to promise them that I would tell nobody where they were. Um, and wh wh which I have never told. Not a soul have I told where they were. Absolutely. Um, and, and uh, but I do know that there are people in tents. Now, I often get calls from people um, that are worried about somebody that's out on the streets at night. And even as a county councillor, the only thing that I can do is contact the Simon community. And the Simon community will arrive with a tent and with a sleeping bag and with food that, that the people can actually eat fresh food because I can't provide fresh food. Yeah. Um, for them to eat and tell them to, to find a field somewhere or along the bank of a river or under a tree somewhere, set up your tent there and sleep. That to me again is criminal. There is no emergency accommodation no. for people like that. No. Now there is emergency accommodation, but they have to go to the county council first, report as homeless, and while they're waiting um, to be put on the housing list, um, they, they, they can be put into emergency accommodation then.
You know, there was even such a thing as emergency, emergency accommodation. You know, when the emergency yeah, accommodation. I know three, was, three fairly young people in their late twenties, early thirties. I'm in contact with them regularly. You know, they they they, they know me, so they know who I am. But yeah. they're sleeping wherever they can find to sleep. Yeah. In Limerick. Yeah. And there's many more like them. There's no discussion anymore now about homelessness. No. Uh, and there's still people dying on the streets. Yes. But as you said. What do you, I don't want to get too political, but, um, and as I said, the easiest thing to do is, is knock people. But this government, to me, does not instill confidence in the general citizenship in the Republic, Ken. What about you? No. Um, the, the problem, Pat, is that the people most affected are the people who tend not to vote. Um, the people who are looked after well, if there is an announcement of 4.1 million like there was yesterday uh, uh, for investment into libraries. Now, we all know that, you know, education is the key and that uh, reading and, and, and writing is important. But when you don't, when you have people that can't eat, that have no food to eat, we, priorities would tell me that that 4.1 million euros should, should have been used in a better way. We have libraries right now. They may not be up to exact standards or what they should, but, but we have them. But people are sleeping out in the cold. And we all know it's getting colder these nights. Um, they're cold and they're hungry and they don't have a roof over their heads. And in many places, they're attacked and assaulted and they have their possessions robbed and their possessions won't be a whole lot would carry it in a, in a small shopping bag. You know, and we have to get our priorities right. And, and as regards having faith in the government, I have none, absolute none, but I don't see a, an alternative there. You know, don't talk to me with Sinn Féin as far as I'm concerned. They're just part of the, the clique, you know. The, the... Well, I must say, uh, without getting too political, Ken, I, they, to me, personally speaking, this is my own personal opinion, not the opinion of Lear Media, is mm. I've been, I could say, disappointed Yeah. in the party who's the second biggest party in the doll, you know? Yeah. They haven't been as impactful as I expected them to be. Despite their disappointment not getting into government, that's only half the point. The, the representation but, in the doll has been pretty poor. But Pat, I think... While a lot of people are thinking that, I think we have to go back to 2008 and 2010 to what that party did to this country. We can't forget that. So we shouldn't expect much from them anyway. Yes. Whereas people tend to forget what these people were responsible for. You know, we're talking about Fianna <clears throat> Fáil and the Green Party and, 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 and uh, they did an awful injustice to the people of Ireland back then. Yeah. They signed us up willingly for 42% of the debts of Europe. Irish and European banks, bondholders, yeah. speculators, and developers. You know, and Fine Gael came after them then, and they converted this debt into public debt uh, with the excuse that it was going to save 500 million euros for the people of Ireland. But it made the debt public, and it means that our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren will be repaying these odious gambling debts until the mid 2050s and that's why you have so many people that will never ever recover from the recession of a decade ago they'll never recover they will never be given the opportunity to recover and all we can do is try and rescue them from their current situations and we'll go back to where we nearly started ken the jadaville experience as you said is that going to be and now I'm going, obviously has been represented. Who's the Minister for Defence? Is it Varadkar? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, look, they tried this a few years ago and they did give them some sort of service medals, but not the medals, um, the, the medals of ga gallantry that were recommended by Comment and uh, Quinlan. And yeah. there was Distinguished Service Medals as well that he recommended for other um, soldiers. They yeah. weren't um, given either. But... We can only hope that more county councils come on board and that the government feel pressurised from the whole country um, in order to, to give these medals to these men. Because these men are in their 90s now, the survivors. And yeah, It's been 50 years, Shamila. Yeah. 60 so, years. 60 years, yeah. 
and and, and um, we can only eight, seven or eight, eight of them are still alive. There's eight of them still alive, yeah, mm. and that's eight, army, eight out of um, eight out of thirty two. Sorry, I was in the army with one of the chaps, my friend of mine. Were you killed in the Lebanon, Thomas yeah. Farris? Right, right. Room in, in the 70s, I think. Yes, know. yeah, I remember that. It's still a, a challenging uh, mission for people, you know? Yeah, and, and the memories of that would be fairly raw as well. But, so, Ken, I'll tell you one thing. You're some man, some operator, and... Um, well, I can only tell you... Pat, that... like a, a mutual admiration society, but I genuinely believe that if we had more people to the caliber of you on councils, We'd have a more humane face and maybe a little less hungry children and a little less poverty, a little less coldness in society today. And I'm delighted that you took the time out and from your busy schedule to join us here on Lear Confidential on Lear Media. So, Ken, thank you very much for being well, with us. Well, thank you very much, Pat. And I will return the compliment. I really appreciate your kind words there. But without decent journalists and reporters reporters just like you i will the likes of me will get nowhere we need people like you standing with us well ken thank you very much and thanks, um, thanks very much, we, Pat. we'll send you the we'll send you the link and uh, come in if you're around for yeah. us, you know but for this edition will. from lear confidential lear media tv thank you ken and goodbye thanks pat <laughs>